All right, good morning. We are gonna be going over your science unit test. This is your review, so uh, you're welcome. All right, so we are gonna dive right in. Uh, first thing you need to know is APE. Remember, if you need to find the proton number, for example, just find the uh, atomic number. Just look on your periodic table, right, right here, periodic table, and find the atomic number. That'll help you. So um, let's say you need to find the, pro, uh, the atomic number, but they have this nucleus and you can't figure it out, but they have the electrons around the outside. Just count the electrons. If you have 15 electrons, you know that your atomic number is 15 and that is phosphorus. So that's how you use APE. APE is an identity strategy. Um, and you will need that for at least five different questions on this test. Next, reactivity. So when I'm thinking about um, the periodic table, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at these groups on the periodic table, right? They, they go up and down. Uh, they can also be called families and columns. You have group number one, which is a highly reactive um, metal group. And you have group number seven, which is a highly reactive non-metal group. So they like to combine to make things, and that makes them stable because all elements, they crave to be stable, just like uh, group eight, which is you know, our um, noble gases, which are very stable and do not combine with any other um, elements. So just be able to di differentiate. As you're looking at your groups on the periodic table and you have one and seven, then you have your other groups, two and six, and three and five. And as you move inside the periodic table, we're not considering group eight right now. We're looking at group ones through seven. As you move to the inside of the periodic table, reactivity gets less and less. Interesting, isn't it? So those two outsides, seven and one, highly reactive. Group one has one valence electron to give away. They have one and, and they want to become stable. They want to they, they want a, um, an outer out octet, they call it, um, and they want it to be full, and so they just have one, so it's easier to give away one than gain seven. So they will lose that electron to become a positive ion um, versus, versus group seven, which has seven valence electrons, it's easier just for them to gain one than lose seven. So they will gain that electron and become a negative ion. So just understand the differences between there. If you're ever unsure of how many valence electrons a, a, uh, an element has, look at what group it's in, and that will tell you what, uh, um, how many uh, valence electrons it has. So you have group one and two, and then we have that, that, le that um, lower group, the lower group grouping of um, metals those are not considered in reactivity. And then we have group three, also known as 13, four, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. Group one through seven, uh, those are your reactive groups. As you move closer on the inside, the less reactive they are, but one and seven are, are the most highly reactive um, groups, one being metals, seven being nonmetals, and then you have group eight which is um, non-reactive. So let's move on to the, so we're kind of talking about the periodic table. Um, we know that it goes from left to right and it increases, left and right, top to bottom, and it increases in uh, pro protons as you move along. So one on the periodic table is hydrogen, number two on the periodic table is uh, helium, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of just follow along and know that as you're moving from left to right, top to bottom, the um, proton number of each of these uh, elements is increasing. And also, so we have our groups, already talked about it, and then we have our periods or rows that go left to right. Row one, row two, row three, four, five, six, and seven. The only thing those things have in common is Everything in row five, five orbitals. Everything in row one, one orbital. Everything in row three, three orbitals. So that's all that there is in common, but just understand that periods and rows go side to side, and um, they share, the only thing they share in common is the number of orbitals. Bohr diagram, 
So your Bohr diagram is pretty much a group of circles. Um, you have your um, circle in the middle, which is your um, your nucleus, and it'll have whether in you know they can they can have circles with pluses or and you know dark circles or light circles and shaded circles, whatever. So you'll be able to see typically what the inside of that nucleus. Um, not necessarily looks like, but how many particles are in there. And then you will have circles around the outside, which are your orbitals. So when you're looking at a Bohr diagram, use APE strategy to identify what mystery atom you're looking at. You can look at, um, you can count the protons um, in, this, in the center, but if you're unsure, let's say, you're, let's say there's four light ones and five shaded ones and there's no other information there. That's not really conclusive. There's a couple things you can do to figure out what that mystery element is. You can add them all up and get nine, and you can find the, peri the element on the periodic table that has nine in its mass, or you can count the electrons around the outside, right? And so that could help. If you were to do that on this particular element, you would count four. And so you would know that that element is beryllium. The other thing you, you, would, you can try and deduct is what group is that in? How can you figure that out by not looking at your periodic table? Yeah, you could count your outer orbital and know that there's two of your four electrons in the outer orbital that would put it in group two. So that's just a, a way to try and figure some of this stuff out. Valence electron, again, uh, the definition of valence electron is electrons in the outer orbital. So there's only two elements on the periodic table that their total elements or total electrons and valence electrons are the same. Any idea which two those are? Hydrogen and helium. That's right. Um, hydrogen has one electron and that electron is in the outer orbital. Helium has two electrons and that, um, the, you know, those two electrons are in the outer orbital. And then you have, you know, the rest of the periodic table. Um, so know that those electrons in the outer orbital are your valence, and we know that every single element in group one has one valence electron. Every element in group seven has seven valence electrons. Every element in group eight does not have eight valence electrons. It has their full. They have eight except for one, which is helium, has two. We know that that outer orbital is full. Remember, the rule of um, uh, electrons in the orbital is two, eight, eight. So it's two electrons in the first orbital, eight in the second, eight in the third for a total of 18. And that takes us all the way through the periodic table till number 18, which is argon, which hopefully you've me uh, memorized those. Structure, protons, neutrons in the, in the nucleus, and um, they are protons positive, neutrons no charge. So we know that our, um, the charge of our nucleus will be positive because the only uh, particle in the nucleus that has um, uh, a charge is your protons. So um, make sure you know that. And then we have electrons around the outside. So we're thinking about particle size. We know that protons and neutrons have one AMU, so their mass is relatively the same. And then you have electrons, which, be, which would be significantly smaller. In, in fact, in middle school, we, we pretty much say that they're weightless. So we don't consider electron weight in middle school when we are weighing um, um, you know, the, the masses of atoms. So if we have nine particles in our nucleus, we know our mass is nine. Properties, metals, take up a majority of the periodic table on the, on the left side. We know they're malleable. We know they're ductile. We know they have luster. We know, um, we know that they are good conductors of uh, electricity. We know that they will lose electrons to form positive ions. And then we have our nonmetals, which are opposite of that. They're not lustrous. They're not malleable. They're not good, good conductors of um, heat and electricity. They're not um, 
uh, they, they gain electrons to form negative ions. So they're the complete opposite of uh, metals. And then you have your metalloids on, uh, along the stair-step line that share, um, they, they share both, right? So there would be brittle, maybe shiny, um, that type of thing. So just be able to um, differentiate between them. And then we have uh, charges of atoms. So there's two different charges you need to pay attention to. The nucleus, always positive, always. So the, ch the, the charge of the nucleus of boron would be plus five. The charge of the nucleus of hydrogen would be plus one. The charge of the nucleus of argon would be plus 18, positive 18. You can take that to the bank. All you got to do is know how many protons it is, put a plus there, boom, you got the charge of the nucleus. Now, the charge of the atom is a little bit different because, remember, you have to compare P and E. You have to compare protons and electrons. If they're the same, it's a neutral atom. If, um, if it reacted, it either gained or lost electrons. So all you do is compare. If after it reacts, it has more protons, then we know it's a positive. If after it reacts, it has more um, electrons, we know it's going to be negative. In fact, you can take it a step further. We know that every element in the first row, nope, in the first group is going to be plus one. We know that every element in group two is going to be plus two. And we know that every element in group three is going to be plus three. Four is carbon group. We ignore that. It can go either way. Um, and that, won't, that is untested in middle school. And then uh, group five will be minus three because it's going to gain three electrons to become full. Group six is minus two because it already has six um, valence electrons. It needs two more to become full. And then group seven is going to be minus or minus one because it just needs one more electron to become full. So that is the breakdown of um, the charge of the, of the atom if it reacts. So sometimes the example that they'll give on the test is a theoretical one. It won't be an actual atom. So my tip for you is just compare protons and electrons whatever that mystery atom is. If it has two more protons, the charge is plus two. But read the wording. The answer could say the atom's nucleus would be plus two, which, which probably would not be true because it would have more protons. Just make sure you have your wits about you and you're paying attention to the question. When it's talking about overall charge of the atom, all you do is compare P and E, if it has more protons, it's positive. If it has more negatives, it's negative. Um, and then you just say um, whatever the other team won by. If it's got more protons, two more protons, then it's plus two. If it only has one more electron, it's going to be minus or minus one. And if it has three more electrons, it's minus three. So there's that. Um, it, remember when, I, when we first started going down this road and talking about, um, you know, atoms, I made you guys imagine a marble on the 50-yard line of Dallas Stadium. That would be the theoretical size of the nucleus if you blew the microscopic nu nucleus up to the size of a marble. The atom, the entire side of the atom, would be about the size of Dallas Stadium, which is huge. So we know that if we know that's true and we know that the mass comes from the nucleus, boy, that atom is made up of empty space, isn't it? And the electrons are those things that are just going around the outside. The, the, the negatively charged atoms, the weightless atoms that are going around the outside, even much more smaller than the particles that are inside of that marble um, in the nucleus. So atoms are made up of mostly empty space. Mind-blowing, right? And then if you're trying to figure out new, neutrons, you're not sure, remember, if you know the mass of the atom, let's take chlorine, for example. My mass is 35 and you know the atomic number, which is 17. Then you take 35, you minus 17, and we know that that atom will have 18 neutrons in the nucleus. And that's it, guys. Good luck on your test. Um, we'll see you in the class. Thanks.